Okay, so thank you all for coming tonight. My name is Les Allen. I'm the convener, uh, the facilitator of this um, Philosophy Matters uh, group. And our subject tonight is, are there limits on the right to free speech? And uh, we're privileged to have two speakers tonight. So let me say a little about tonight's talk. So firstly, Martin Coleman will argue the case for free speech and free expression, which helps form the basis for an informed populace. Without the ability to freely express our thoughts, it can mean ideas go unshared and social progress hampered. The ability to share and discuss an idea, no matter how great or how abhorrent it is, is the pinnacle of modern democracy. However, blasphemy, offence taking and hate speech come part and parcel of free speech. Between censorship and political correctness, numerous approaches are being enacted to try and control what is being said. We can't help how others react or respond to what is said, and perhaps we try to take it for granted that those listening to us are of a discerning and critical thinking nature. Martin will look at what such great writers as Voltaire, Christopher Hitchens, Thomas Paine, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. and others have to say on the matter. Akiva Quinn will argue the case for free speech and free expression subject to restrictions on communication that incites violence and is likely to lead to significant harms. In such cases, the clear and present dangers from this expression means that such free speech does not warrant protection under the law as the harms to individuals or groups outweighs any benefit from unlimited freedom to express sentiments without regard for the predictable consequences. While free speech extends to artistic, private and political speech and can justifiably include causing offence and even bigotry or blasphemy, there should be a line where limitations on free speech are imposed to avoid direct, avoid direct or indirect harms. Akiva will explore philosophers and other writers on free speech and how they should be understood to protect free speech while seeking to prevent harms which demonstrably and predictably result from free speech, from hate speech, threats and incitement to violence. So a little about our two speakers. Martin Coleman has an extensive background in computer science and technical research. An avid student of science and philosophy, Martin loves to delve into areas that blur computer science, philosophy, and general science. Besides being an avid reader and writer, he dabbles in short film and documentary making and is planning a philosophy and science podcast. His favorite areas to delve into include free speech, critical thinking, and the practical application of philosophy. Akiva Quinn is a philosopher and IT professional with a passion for moral, social and political issues. He studied philosophy and sociology at Monash University and completed an MA on human rights in 2010. Akiva has presented talks and workshops on meaning in life, existentialism, the good life, ethics and political philosophy. And his research encompasses philosophy and religion. He enjoys reading and engaging with others to explore ideas that matter. So each of our two speakers tonight will speak for around about 25 minutes um, and Martin will speak first uh, and then Akiva. So if I can ask Martin to get the bowl ball rolling, Martin Coleman. Uh, hello all, thank you for, um, for that lovely introduction, Les. And I also wanted to say thank you and hello to um, my uh, <laughs> my friendly antagonist Akiva Quinn. <laughs> uh, this subject um, means a great deal to me. I consider it very important. And when presented with the opportunity to say, "Hey, would you like to do this?" I proverbially and literally jumped at the uh, at the chance to, to do this. Uh, I don't think I would be getting too far ahead of myself in saying that this is something which has been maybe about five or six years in the making. And I had to distill about an hours worth of material down into this because it's so extensive and uh, we just delve into so much. So 
hopefully something I've done here makes some sense. Uh, but yes, so I will be uh, delving into um, the writers as mentioned, and hopefully we'll be able to get something fun and productive out of it. Now, just before, um, someone did say, um, happy Noam Chomsky day. And I was going to throw in a quote from Noam Chomsky, but I can do that a bit later because he actually had something which is incredibly relevant to say on this matter. In fact, um, without even realizing it, the, the, the quote I've got of his could almost summarize my 25 minutes, but um, I won't go into that. I just want to say that, um, hey, he's clever. All right, so let's get into this. And again, thank you for sacrificing a very serviceable Tuesday evening to listen to me drone on. So are there limits on the right to free speech by that fella making the case to permit and defend free expression? Should there be limits for free speech and free expression? And how does that fit in with blasphemy, censorship, and political correctness? So here I will attempt to say that free speech is not only important, but paramount to any modern democracy and society in general. These three items, which could each do with a 20 minute presentation just on themselves, are what, from an ideological perspective, someone like me might be very politely trying to uh, fight against, and I will try to address them a bit further on. So um, does Australia have free speech? Uh, I've asked this from many, many people, and they are all quite shocked when I tell them that we take it for granted that we are able to, to, to say what we want so far, but that's actually not the case. We have no Bill of Rights, and it is not mentioned anywhere in the chapter three, chapter, sorry, chapter 63, chapter 64, an act to constitute Australia, it is not there either. There's only an implied right to political speech, which has only been briefly tested in the courts, Nationwide News Limited versus Wills in 1992. And the other one, the ACT, um, ACT TV. And um, I, don't know, I don't know if that's cut off for anyone else over here. I don't know why that happened. Um, there was a fantastic article by Amanda Yeo uh, in uh, Life Hacker from early this year, who goes over all of this to say that uh, it's a damn shame, but we actually do not have freedom of speech. So what I was going to do was um, look at the whole matter in a general perspective and let you know kind of what uh, something closer to home, uh, what the situation actually is. So, I mean, I know someone might even bring up, say, protesting and being able to put placards and banners all over the place. I'll get to that later. And of course, there is an excellent Find the Law article that says, do we have the right to freedom of speech in Australia? Its conclusion is absolutely not. Um, but it's just something which has not really been enshrined or, or tested or codified yet, but we still somehow manage to get away with it. So my first and foremost writer is Voltaire. Uh, in, in, uh, I am, uh, in a small way, uh, his uh, biographer, born Francois-Marie Arroway um, in that time. Um, I've left off the born year, that's great. Uh, French Enlightenment writer, historian, philosopher, known for his wit, criticism of organized religion, advocate of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, or should I say freedom of religion and for freedom from religion and separation of church and state, some of his best known works. A Candid, Letters from England, which I can highly recommend. Zadig, which uh, in some ways is actually um, supposed to be um, the forerunner of the modern detective story uh, due to some uh, deductive methods, which were probably inspired by um, Socrates, obviously, back in the day. But yeah, so before even Edgar Allan Poe, he apparently wrote some things that were about you know, deduction. Think Sherlock Holmes. Although I shouldn't because I don't have hours because I love to talk about Sherlock Holmes. Um, and yeah, and uh, one of his stories also talks about writing using uh, forensic evidence about tracing footprints. Um, no popular fiction before then had really gone into that. But anyway, I'm happy to be fact checked on that one. <clears throat> so why he was such a big advocate was because when he wrote uh, one of his earlier plays, which um, lambasted or satired the French king, he was banished 
and he actually wrote a series of uh, essays called Letters from England when he was um, when he was sent there. He would criticize their tyrannical ways um, and when he because he was supposed to have used over 300 different pen names throughout his whole life. Uh, he made satirical fiction where some people managed to figure out who he was really talking about and that brought up a whole lot of social complexities for him. Uh, if anyone has seen the magnificent movie Citizen Kane by Orson Welles, uh, you would kind of get a hint as to what he might have, what, what Voltaire might have been doing in writing is what Orson Welles was doing in, uh, in movie form and celluloid. He all have advocated for freedom of thought. We wanted us to draw our own conclusions using our own investigations without relying upon any supposed authority forcing ideas. He was biased. He was against organized religion. He was particularly critical of the Roman Catholic Church. So when I say without rel relying upon any supposed authority, that's implicitly them because they were the predominant thought leaders and social leaders at the time. And he thought that that was just plainly ridiculous. But we, I want to go back to um, the kind of the start very briefly but Socrates was prosecuted because of his religious ideas and political associations. Basically, it started by him saying, I don't think the gods, the Athenian gods, I don't think the Athenian gods really care about us. And in fact, I'm not even sure they exist. A bit more complicated than that, but that's basically why Socrates got into a bit of trouble. And then later on, uh, Euripides also said, this is slavery, not to speak one's thought. So basically from Voltaire, we see the um, it becoming more solid, more established about, we want to be able to criticize what the, the rulers of society are saying and what they're doing and why can't we? Um, but obviously uh, Socrates uh, yeah, got, the, got the sock of it first, so there we are. Voltaire said, it is clear that the individual who persecutes man, his brother, because he is not of the same opinion, is a monster. Absolutely true. But he goes further. He said, uh, like Thomas Paine, he says, the right to be able to say what I want, doesn't matter the content, good or bad or neutral, is still more important than the ability of actually, you know, than saying uh, the content of the speech, even the content of the speech doesn't matter compared to our ability to freely think and then being able to freely express what we want. And this is kind of refined a little bit by when he said, judge a man by his questions rather than by his answers, because when someone is asking you a question, you can find their motivation, you can find their, their motive, you can find what they're really going for. Anyone can give an answer whether it's true or not. They can be their way out of anything. I'm not gonna go down the political tangent, no. Um, basically, it's what someone asks or shows you where they're really trying to get to. Now, this quote uh, is one of my favorite. Uh, even my own grandmother knows this quote and it's actually not from Voltaire. I disagree with what you say, but we'll defend to the death for your right to say it. It's actually by his biographer, Evelyn Beatrice Hall um who was asked to summarize his overall attitude approach and uh, perspective to free speech in general and he based and 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 in summarizing his entire life's work and, and attitude to free speech that was that was basically uh what uh, what she said he did say something a little bit similar but worded very very differently in one of his letters um i haven't found a letter i've only found snippets of it it was going to be a tangent and not really relevant here because it was just, I've already got enough here. Okay, I'm being, I'm spoiling myself. Christopher Hitchens, uh, one of my absolute favorite writers. Um, top three easy, ever. Um, many of you will probably know of him from his book, God is Not Great. Um, British American author, journalist, uh, contrarian, self-described anti-theist. He saw all religions as false, harmful, and authoritarian, argued for free expression and scientific discovery. Um, some, of his, uh, some of my favorite works there probably are God is Not Great, The uh, Missionary Position, Mother Teresa and Theory in Practice um, is, uh, is actually quite good. And uh, 
if you haven't already read it, give it a read. Um, it, it has changed my perspective on a few things and a few people that I've actually discussed it with. And of course, Letters to the Young Contrarian, which I've probably read about three times. And hey, if you're feeling like you want to be that person that uh, is a, you know, the, the, the wrench in the works, the, uh, the fly in the ointment, yeah, I'm going to quote Die Hard. Yeah. Um, Letters to the Young Contrarian may motivate you to get out there and make that bit of difference if you want to. Um, it's, a, it's a great read. It's not meant to be motivational or encouraging, but when you've got such a writer behind it, it happens. So Hitchens basically said, we need to hear every idea from Holocaust deniers, flat earthers, anti-vaxxers, religious fundamentalists, we need to hear them. We fall very dangerously into becoming an echo chamber and an echo chamber is not good. Hate speech is still important because we need to know what other people are thinking. We need to know about their perspectives. We need to know about how they got to why they hate someone or something. We can't gag them. We can't, as, um, as one other um, discussion and debate said about padlocking lips, we can't fall into that. Because as Voltaire said, we, we, we need to know what is going on. We need to know what is going on in the minds of people. If that includes an occasional bit of speech here that is completely hateful, sometimes you've got to take the good with the bad. I expand upon this later. Now, several people have received death threats um, from writing Salman Rushdie, Ayan Hirsi Ali, and a few others. Ethan says that this is purely from their being insecure of their own ideas, opinions, or justifications. If you need to resort to death threats to try and silence your opponent, what does it really say about you? Okay, this is basically how he summarizes it. There is a utilitarian case of free expression. It recognizes that the freedom to speak must also be insisted on for the person who thinks differently because it is pointless to support only free speech for people who agree with you. It is not only unprincipled to want that, but also self-defeating. For your own sake, you need to know how other people think. That, Forbidden Thoughts American Enterprise, is actually from an article he wrote, which is actually is entitled, now I forgot the title, it's about why hate speech should be allowed. And he was highly encouraging of it for that simple reason. Not for trying to incite the violence or get people to be riled up by idiots, but because the point still matters, you have to know what people are thinking. Okay, John Stuart Mill, as previously heard, um, also says basically the same. It says that even if uh, the uh, silenced opinion may be an error, uh, and as it may and very commonly is, it can also contain a portion of truth. And since the general prevailing opinion on any subject is rarely or never the whole truth, it is only by the collision of adverse opinions that the remainder the truth has any chance of being supplied. You think you've got 98% of the truth, but sorry, you think you've got the whole truth, but you actually may only have 98%. Let that misinformed person who's ranting and raving and carrying on say something because they may be able to give you that extra bit and you go, aha, you have an epiphany and you go, okay, I think I've got the full picture. It may even help you find out why someone who is opposing your view or saying that nasty stuff where they might have misunderstood something and then you can add the rest of the picture. And of course, my old favorite again, Thomas Paine, The Age of Reason. He also wrote a fantastic book called Common Sense. Basically says that anyone who denies to another a right to have a different opinion makes a slave of himself to his present opinion because he precludes himself the right of changing it. Basically becomes an echo chamber. You're giving yourself and your friends no new information, no new perspectives. That doesn't help anyone. Okay, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. was um, the famous court judge who said in 1919 that shouting fire in a crowded theater was no good and therefore there must be an exception to the First Amendment. The most stringent of protection of free speech would not present a man, would not protect a man falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. He says that due to such circumstances and the nature of this create a clear and present danger that Congress has a right to prevent. He's saying you can say, but 
there's going to be a limit and this creates what a lot of people thought of as the slippery slope. However, it was fully overturned in Brandenburg versus Ohio 1969 in America that says that uh, you know, it guarantees freedom of speech, does not permit a state to prescribe an advocacy or any use of force of law in violation. They do make an exception that says, unless it is directing to, or to inciting or producing imminent lawless actions, such as a riot, and is likely to incite or produce such action, there is that little tiny sliver of an exception saying, you can say what you like and express it however you want. We just draw the line of fiercely provoking potential violence leading to potential death. But that is the only exception. And even then, it's case by case. Which is why you come the good with the bad. You have to understand that real harm can come to people. People in general can and will say really nasty things. Not everyone's the same. I had to include the thing with the Joker from The Dark Knight. They, some people just want to see the world burn. You get the good with the bad. You can use the postal system to send a nice letter, or you can send it to send death threats. You can have a knife that you can fill out a fish or stab someone. There's different cases out there. You can always see about the main motive behind something. So why should we punish everyone just because there's a few people who are, uh, you know, are spoiling it? And rather than trying to restrict how the message is being sent or even the messenger, you have to realize that people, when they do stupid things, we already have laws to punish that. We don't want to restrict the ability to still say that thing because echo chamber, we need to know what people are thinking, etc. Okay, and basically we go, look, people are going to have different ideas, different ways to express them. Everyone in the world thinks differently. No single, no two people will ever think the exact same way about the exact same thing. Okay. There's always going to be a percentage of the population who are going to be more receiving ideas. And there are also those who will just reject anything new. Maybe it's ultra conservative. Maybe they're just stuck in their ways, whatever. But we still need to fix our approach to how we get our ideas out to, to those people. But we also still need to decide on a very peaceful, um, yeah, just a, a, a good equal way to be able to share ideas, uh, to be able to discuss them and find out how, they, uh, how, how things might be changing in society. Um, universities were like the birthplace or formerly thought of as the birthplace of ideas. If, if nothing new could be shared and explored, uh, in, in a university, the birthplace of free thought and then uh, free expression and uh, collaboration of new ideas and innovation, then where can you do it? There was a case, uh, I think it was 2017. I'm not going to say the university's name because I think it was one of two. And I remember it coming up in the office when I, um, when I worked there. But there was a bit of a protest in a major Melbourne university where staff were going out there because they were being gagged it wasn't anything particularly controversial but they were going to be silenced and they said if university is not the place to be able to say these things what's the point the here is some video it's only about 10 seconds long and here comes the video go ahead when a doctor, when dr samuel johnson had finished his great um, lexicography the first real english dictionary he was visited by <laughs> various delegations of people to congratulate him, including a delegation of London's respectable womanhood who came to his parlour in Fleet Street and said, Doctor, we congratulate you on your decision to exclude all indecent words from your dictionary. And he said, ladies, I congratulate you on your persistence in looking them up. <laughs> so the point of that is borderline on, on censorship. Hopefully everyone realised what was going on there. They went to congratulate him on not having offensive words, swear words, some that would probably make George Carlin proud. And he didn't include them. And they went there to go and see if they were in there because then they'd have ammunition to be offended and complain about it. So on being offended, no one has the right to be offended. I can't stress that enough. I mean, in today's society, we're finding offensive at everything. No one has the right to not be offended. 
you want to go and live, you want to go and get your bubble wrap and cotton wool and, and protect yourself, you go and do that, but don't force it on everyone else. Ah, oh, this is a harsh life lesson. Some people are more easily offended than others. I know, shocking, right? Who would have thunk it? It's true. I've met them. I've met people that will be offended by using the word damn. And I've seen some others that uh, would probably join along in a, a join in a merry sing along by sailors and everything in between. Come on. You can't live by treading on eggshells all the time. Okay. If you've got someone that you care about or you like someone and you want to be careful about what you say around them, that's, that's fine. That's, that's your thing. Cause you don't want to annoy them. You don't want to upset them. But there's some other, but you could also be someone who just says, I don't care what other people think about me. And I'm just going to say blah, because it's what I honestly hold as my, my opinions. Well, I'm obviously, con I'm, I'm very convinced of it. Very sincerely held opinion. If you hurt someone's feelings, then they should just go, wait, well, you know, whatever. You don't need to become enemies over anything. And you shouldn't be treading on eggshells, whether on personal level, social, political, it's just ridiculous. We should be able to criticize. This is important. Yeah, we can praise everyone. Everyone loves a bit of praise, a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of flattery, sure. Oh, you're so awesome. You're a genius. Oh, sorry. I thought there was a mirror of me right there. Um, we should be able to criticize anyone, anything, any circumstances at any time, should we deem it justified. Doesn't mean to get a megaphone and start mouthing off. It just means to speak up if you think that something just isn't quite right. I mean, if you've been invited to do that too, all the better. You may get a little bit of a platform for it. Otherwise, yeah, you may just get told to shut up. But if that's the worst that you get told, then I think you're winning. But the other thing is, let's just say that we have some general rule, we have some central code. Who do we choose to be the central arbiter and source of saying what is considered offensive? Taking all the above into account about what, no one has the right to not be offended. And some people will find things, certain things offensive that other people won't. Well, you've got to find a compromise. You've got to find, okay, but who would you choose to say, I entirely 100% trust you to think on behalf of me? Sorry, I mean, judge on behalf of me of what, uh, what should be considered offensive. This is uh, particularly also in um, conservative natures, especially. I love this. If someone tells me that I've hurt their feelings, I say, well, I'm still waiting to hear what your point is. Okay, um, I think there's another video here, just warning. I've treated to just now. If people are determined to be offended, if they will climb up on the ladder, balancing it precariously on their own toilet system, to be upset by what they see through the neighbor's bathroom window, there's nothing you can do about that. <laughs> see, what he was going on about is if someone is going to go and balance a ladder on top of the toilet system so they can look through the window so they can be offended by what they see in someone else's uh, bathroom, what can you do? Someone is going out of their way to say, oh, that's disgusting, or I don't like what I see, I'm going to complain and whinge about it. You can't stop those people from being offended. They're seeking out offense. They're seeking out what for any other person would be just normal stuff. But he goes on to say that blasphemy should not exist in a secular democracy. So I'm going over certain aspects of how people will try to padlock our lips, gag us, etc. All ideas should be criticized, evaluated, and even ridiculed. If anyone tries to uh, assert something and the more effort should be made to justify it. Um, I won't go into that particularly right now because it touches on a couple of uh, matters which, not out of censorship, but out of politeness, I won't mention because it is a tangent and it's not for this talk. But there were particular aspects of a certain top three religion in the world that Hitchens was particularly uh, critical of in that aspect. But if we think that there should be a father state, people already think Australia is a nanny state. Um, that says, hey, I want you to think on behalf of me as to what I should see or hear or not see in here. Um, and if you think that something might be harmful to someone, that comes into, that comes into, into censorship. You know, um, whether it could be an asterisk replacing a letter on words or 
anything else. Um, it's, it's a slippery slope. It's messy. Am I saying that absolutely nothing ever should be censored? I wouldn't say that. I would say that I think it comes down to what would be appropriate given the circumstances and the message you're trying to get across. I mean, you wouldn't go into a church holding something that they're going to be not happy about. You don't go and try and stop someone going to a hospital, for instance, and then saying something about, oh, you're all going to die or whatever. Okay. People should be able to go, hey, you know, that probably wouldn't be a good idea. It's not going to win me any new friends. I do touch upon this a little bit later. Now, one other pet hate of mine is political correctness. I hate it with a passion. Changing how we use words, changing words in other uh, contexts um, because we find something uh, offensive. We, we, we find that some other people's feelings are hurt. I really, really hate it. I'll be giving one or two examples um, in a couple of slides. And one thing that I will happily challenge anyone anytime is if someone says that they find something that I have said offensive, I find that offensive. I'm offended by your offendedness because I want to express an idea. And if you can't be an adult and accept it and go, oh, he said something I didn't like, what are you going to do about it? And and I'll just say, hey, Martin, maybe shut up. I'll just decide whether I want to take that suggestion or not. But you know what? If you're just that easily offended, uh, grow up. I think I've got one more video here. Against the proposition. Finally, for the proposition, Christopher Hitchens. Uh, the real question, or if you like, subtext question before us is this, is nothing sacred? What we've really been discussing is the old question of whether or not there's a, there is such an offense as blasphemy or profanity. And now, if I don't tell you exactly what I think, about the simpering speeches that we heard from the other side. I'm not censoring myself. I'm just being polite and civil and saving some of your time. What I will not prevent myself from saying, or will, and will not let anyone else prevent me from saying, is the following. It is wrong and always has been for churches, powerful, secular, human institutions, to claim exemption from criticism, which is what's really being asked here. If there's going to be respect, it has to be mutual. So here he's saying about how religious groups were trying to be uh, exempt from discrimination laws and uh, censorship and being able to then censor in return. Uh, let's just say um, uh, uh, a church service or a, a religious school, for instance, uh, wants to claim exemption from not being able to discriminate against, say, someone's sexual orientation, sexual preference whether they follow the same religion uh, or even follow the same basic philosophies as them, um, that's what they're trying to, uh, to get at. And it's like, well, you know what? You wouldn't like it if the tables were turned. So there's either equal mutual understanding for everyone or there's none. So I'm, uh, this is actually near the end. I am wrapping up. I have no idea about my time right now. Of a critical nature. Okay, so I understand that, as I said, my, my key part is, Free speech is part of a um, modern democracy. The people that sent out for Salman Rushdie's uh, death warrant were not from an area like that. He's now under constant protection because there is an open continuing um, call out for his death for writing a piece of fiction. And I think, um, I think it was Sam Harris who said, um, journalists were killed because of a cartoon end of ethical analysis see how ridiculous it is it's self-describing um also about censorship jd challenges the catcher in the rye talks about sensitive matters um for cultural reasons and, and background these sort of books should still be allowed if someone's unable to read them then obviously not going to become that phase of what's being said i used to go through books as a kid that i really only understood a quarter of which nowadays i might think oh they went there did they and if someone is still going to be able to understand them and they're offended put the book down put it back on the shelf no one's forcing you to read it just go oh i don't like that title or even the author put it back down take some personal responsibility for yourself bloody hell 
Uh, Allen Ginsberg's uh, Howl, which also uh, went uh, through um, a similar bit. Um, this was uh, this was new to me. I didn't know about this until very recently, and uh, it's a poem which goes into you know very sensitive natures, uh, things like that. Um, haven't read it yet. I just knew that it was uh, on the list, and uh, I just wanted to, to to find something and and uh, to see what else could be out there. This, I won't mention the title out of politeness, and I dare will admit I am self-centering myself here. Dick Gregory is um, a uh, spokesman. Um, look him up. Uh, he has an autobiography. Uh, won't say the title again, um, but you can see why that um, uses, uh, uses a racist, uh, racist word uh, from way back. Um, yeah, I really have no nothing further to say. I was going to uh, expand on a couple of these things, but for time, uh, I, I couldn't. So uh, look it up if you want. There was actually another book that came out, I think, uh, a couple of years ago, very recently, um, also with the same name, because I'm wanting to test the mentality uh, of, um, of the public with, here's a word that uh, is in, Okay, I should have swapped these two around. Uh, Inner Blyton is now being censored and rechanged just because they have some old ideals that are no longer applicable and some people are finding those situations offensive. It's a children's book. Bloody hell, no one's going to go and go, you know what, if people climb a tree and they get to the top and they go, hey, I still can't see clouds that's going to take me to a magical land, let the kids play, but come on, nothing wrong with a faraway tree. Mark Twain's various works are now being reworded. Um, uh, several old terms uh, are now being uh, changed to be more appropriate to a modern audience. That is, in my opinion, blasphemy against free speech because if anyone would know Mark Twain was actually not racist at all. And he was using all those words and those circumstances uh, in satire. He was making fun of the racist nature of America at the time and why we shouldn't be because there's nothing to be afraid of. Various video games have also caught out. Uh, and of course, George Carlin's Seven Dirty Words You Can't Say on TV uh, has a few extra bits and pieces as well. Before I get to these concluding comments, the, the main crux of my argument is personal responsibility. Where do we shift the burden? If we say, you got to be careful about what you say because you might offend someone. I don't like that for all the reasons that we've just gone through. If we say you need to take responsibility for the way you're responding, take the responsibility to the listener. You must admit to be offended is a personal choice. No one has the power to offend you without your permission and involvement. Okay. It's just words. If you're feeling hurt by them, it's you doing it. You're the one who's choosing to be hurt by them. Try and be unoffendable. Hard task. Hey, we all got to try. Most people are decent and don't mean any harm. That comes out with, say, incitement of violence and, and hate speech. Most people won't do this because human empathy, human solidarity says we probably shouldn't be an ass to each other. But some people are. Some people just want to watch the world burn. Again, I admit that I have a presumption that some people are critical thinkers of a more discerning nature are able to think for themselves if they're getting offended by something I've said uh, or choose, I might say, um, think about, say, uh, David Irving, who was arrested for what he didn't say, but what he was about to say in Germany. Uh, come on. It's discretion. Make up your own mind, would you? But people should not be offended on behalf of anyone but themselves. I want people to remove groupthink from the equation. If you think that someone has said something and you may relate to a social political group and you know that they're going to find it offensive, that's for them to respond, not you. Just say, oh, they may not like that. Just say, I'm not going to try and stop you from saying the rest of that bit, but they may not like it. The person saying those things can make their own decision about whether they will continue. More likely, they just want to get an idea out. 
And again, I want to say we should be able to say and express what we like using circumstances and discretion to judge what is appropriate. That is my long, windy and wordy way of saying most people will be polite enough to not say anything too outrageous and given the circumstances, just want a peaceful conversation with people, um, a good debate, a good discussion, healthy words being spread and trying to avoid, you know, uh, what, what do you call it? Um, a philosophical, um, a lot of logical fallacies um, and try and be decent. I know tough ask sometimes. And that's it. Um, I will now, yeah, that was pretty much it. So thank you very, very much. And I realize that a hell of a lot of people are commenting. So I'm going to go to stop the screen. I'm now back here. Um, I hope some of that was coherent and some of it was actually entertaining. And um, thank you for listening. So what I'd like to do now is pass over to Akiva to, to do your talk. And then after that, we'll have a bit of backwards and forwards between Akiva and Martin, and then we'll open it up to questions and discussion. Thank you, Akiva. Thank you, Les. Thank you, Martin. I'll bring some slides up. I'm going to be quite explicit about raising the point of tonight's discussion, exploration of these important philosophical, but also practical, political and social questions. I'm going to be quite explicit as treating this as an open question. Are there limits on the right to free speech? And as you will very soon see, if you're not very familiar with the visage of one John Stuart Mill, uh, the outset of my argument will be couched in terms of his classic work on liberty, and you will be unsurprised to hear that I, like John Stuart Mill, in certain regards, most clearly outline the case, a pretty hard case to answer, I would say, uh, for some limits being imposed on free speech. I'll explain what those limits are as we proceed, as I proceed for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, but just to be completely clear, there are limits from a moral, social, necessary sustenance, well-being point of view for uh, there are reasons, good reasons for limits on free speech. Regarding the overall thrust of On Liberty, if you haven't read it, it's only 150 some years old. It's been on the market for a while. I'd strongly advocate that um, those of you who haven't to do read it. It's actually a surprisingly readable book for that part of the uh, 19th century from our early modern history. So that quote is in Italian. I won't try and uh, grind my teeth on the Italian as that's not a language I'm familiar with, but the translation is over himself or over oneself, over one's own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. So make no mistake, Lull is, uh, Mull is a supporter of liberty. However, as you will very quickly learn if you aren't really familiar with Mull's work, that is limit, uh, liberty subject to certain very necessary constraints or limits. Hence, are there limits on the right to free speech? I would say so, yes, and so would Mill. Um, here's a longer quote from Mill before we get to the current uh, political context where these ideas have been played out on a rather public stage at the US Capitol, as you'll see from the image. Human beings should be free to form opinions and to express them openly. But even opinions lose their immunity when the circumstances in which they are expressed are such that merely expressing them is a positive incitement to some harmful act. Same text on Liberty 1859. Um, it's a partisan process, so I'm not making any pretense for what it is. Um, but the second impeachment of then President Trump, about to finish his uh, term, um, after the Capitol riots on the 6th of January of this year, uh, impeached Trump in the House for incitement of insurrection. So speech is not always and necessarily harmless. I think we know that. It's common sense. And there's some pretty significant moral and political considerations weighty, including the noose you can see there, those who live in uh, Melbourne, Victoria, have seen some similar symbols on our street streets uh, in in uh, advocacy supposedly of freedom or liberty. 
but looking at some pretty significant symbols and incitement, certainly in the case of the U.S. Capitol. There were five people who died that day, including um, a number of police officers. Um, the sign there, by the way, says, uh, says, give us liberty or death, which to me suggests, um, as some fairly learned commentators have suggested, a kind of logical non sequitur. And if that's really what you want, if you prize liberty so highly that death is the alternative, you're probably not putting forward an especially rational or useful philosophical argument. So that's one bit of mole. Here's another bit of mole, which isn't perhaps as well known as it should be. Uh, there's an image which I'm going to pretend is uh, a, a crowd, an angry mob outside the house of a corn dealer. Uh, mole didn't illustrate his book, so that's not actually an illustration of such, but it will serve the purpose. Here's what Mill says. Someone can justly be punished for announcing the idea that corn dealers are starvers of the poor, orally or passing out you know, pamphlets or placards with this message to an excited mob that is gathered in front of a corn dealer's house. And the context within this particular section is that criticism, if you look on the right, I've written there, criticism ought to be allowed to pass freely in the world of print. If you hold the view and you want to criticize corn dealers as starvers of the poor, and you wish to do that in print, I mean, this is, you know, going back to a time when the internet wasn't even anyone's brainchild, um, then Mill suggests you can do that. However, with an angry mob gathered outside or an excited mob, he says, at the corn dealer's house, it's fairly clear that there's a clear and present danger uh, to the corn dealer if you hand out placards or tell them in that particular context that corn dealers are starvers of the poor. Okay, so here's, here's the rub. The argument rests on real world consequences of a certain category of free speech, which in most democracies, including in the US, but we can debate that uh, particular political context um, shortly, are not protected speech. Not all speech is protected speech. Not all free speech is therefore allowed. Most free speech is, but most speech is protected. There's some categories most of us would probably agree do not deserve to be protected by law because of the moral and practical consequences of so allowing. Uh, let's start with Mill again. Um, this is his one very simple principle, which is at the very heart of his entire text on liberty, the sole end for which mankind are warranted individually or collectively in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. That's called the harm principle. Almost every undergraduate at Australia and other universities will study the harm principle and will argue, discuss, try to delineate where the boundaries of that principle are. However, it's a, a fairly brave uh, position to suggest that the harm principle has no traction, has no reach, has no place at all in the debate around free speech. But I'm happy to entertain any and all views on that matter when we come to questions and answers. Um, the people very sadly depicted on the right hand side of this slide were British politicians, members of parliament who were murdered. Uh, Joe Cox at the top of the screen was murdered in 2016. Um, right-wing neo-Nazi sympathizing individual. Um, a whole lot of hate speech had already been offered by him. Would defending the lives of MPs be afforded simply by banning his or a number of people's hate speech? I'm not pretending that, but you would suggest, I would suggest at least, that the prevalence of hate speech um, is a factor, is a causal and contributory factor. Uh, David Ames was killed uh, this year, and there were comments from, I think it was the, uh, the Home Secretary and others about the prevalence of online hate speech. I've got a figure, something like 124,000 incidents of that cited up until uh, I think it was March of this year in the UK, that's in a one year period. And that's about a 10% increase from the year before. So those are vast numbers of 
online hate, and we can describe, and I will present in almost my final slide, uh, what hate speech looks like in a bit more detail. In addition, uh, same members of parliament, um, basically commenting on uh, the murder of David Ames this year, acknowledged that the number of threats uh, issued, threats on the life of members of parliament has been simply, you know, out, out, of, out of control, I think was roughly the quotation from, from that particular uh, member of the British parliament, uh, the minister who, who made the comment. So it's a very serious and significant problem in Victoria, those of who live in Australia. We were well aware of pretty direct threats to the Premier of the state um, because of, you know, unpopular, fair enough, uh, you know, pandemic legislation, vaccine mandates and the like. So we'll keep moving. There are quite a few examples to look at, but that should give you a flavour of mill and the harm principle and the very real consequences of certain categories of, uh, of speech, which involves threatening. Um, before we move on, I'll just clarify that every text I've ever read on this topic is very clear that there are um, almost uncontestable categories of speech which would otherwise be free, which are restricted. Those include threats, they include defamation, uh, of persons to basically maintain, you know, people's good character unless they've actually done something, in which case you can criticise them and it's no longer called defamation at law because defamation has to be false among other characteristics of, of defamatory speech and also um, falsifying, you know, commercial speech. So there's a number of things which are pretty much part and parcel of answering yes to are there limits on free speech I will focus mostly because this isn't so much around the commercial sphere or even personal reputation. It's around the political implications of free speech versus hate speech, and that will be my main focus. But just to clarify again, there's a few well-established categories um, where certain speech is not protected speech. In other words, it is no longer free. And by speech, Martin and myself, uh, I think neither of us have mentioned this expressly, we tend to mean speech and expression. And in fact, you'll see an example, examples of expression very soon. Okay, talking of expression, um, this talk should probably have come with um, some adult warnings in terms of language and images, but I'm not seeking to offend, um, simply to display. Um, this is in the last week or so, Madonna outraged, that's her normal mode of operation, so that's fine, take from it what you will, uh, that Instagram censored images of her, which exposed, I think she said, part of a nipple, I haven't seen the unedited image, I'm just seeing what you're seeing, and she decried basically a period of four decades when she's variously um, had to face censorship, uh, sexism, ageism, presumably more recently, and misogyny. So that's, that's her perspective. You'll notice the question at the top of the slide, are these limits on free expression or is that simply a commercial platform making a choice and she could find elsewhere, the, you know, the web won't censor that image particularly. There's far stronger content on the web than that, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, let's look at limits on free expression, at least on particular commercial um, platform a bit further. YouTube, as most of you would be aware, it was quite a big news story, uh, blocked most recently uh, false information about COVID vaccines, sorry, the other way around. They blocked that, I think, in 2020, and more recently blocked uh, anti-vaccine information or misinformation uh, regarding um, authorised approved vaccinations, um, you know, um, more recently. Okay. Um, Let's find some common ground with, you know, what some some aspect of what Martin was talking about. Uh, yeah, look, in Hong Kong, there will be cases. I just found this recently. Uh, there's a story or several stories, children's books about sheep defending their villages from the threats posed by wolves, as you would understand with the uh, legislation there. Um, this was actually relying on older sedition laws, but uh, some of the laws basically aimed at restricting um, the impact of the protesters in Hong Kong in the last year or so. 
uh, that's now basically the next the next frontier. They're taking anything that's got a symbolic reference to protecting yourself from the big bad wolf and uh, wanting to ban that as well. Okay, so there's clearly some limits on free expression, which we may not find uh, suitable there. Um, and just for interest, I heard this recently on the radio, um, a well-known feminist uh, last year, she uh, tweeted, coronavirus isn't killing men fast enough. She withdrew the comment. It's not available online anymore, except in the uh, many news stories that, you know, capture it for uh, forever. So careful what you say on the web. It won't go anywhere. It will remain there forever. She was apparently seeking to make a point, and in her apology, which she did offer in quite a number of, uh, of tweets, um, she also explained that she was looking at a differential impact on women taking on more of the burden at home regarding um, you know, care and, and work from home and everything else. However, coronavirus isn't killing men fast enough would seem like you know, a bit of, if it's to be taken seriously, um, the, the opposite or the, 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 uh, the other version of misogyny being hatred of women would seem like a, a form of misandry, if you, uh, which is hatred of men, if you just took it on its, on its own merit. So there's cases there we can debate. You'll have many, many examples of your own in terms of free speech, free expression, and where that line should be. I'm leaving those pretty much as questions for each of us. Um, I think the questions stop at around this point. We've mentioned Hong Kong on the previous slide. We've now got North Korea. It's interesting in uh, researching a topic like this, the number of examples that literally flood in, and some of them are truly alarming, this one included, regarding free speech or unfree expression in this case. Um, just in the last week, Radio Free Asia, a couple of weeks ago, uh, reported uh, that North Korean students, high school students, were being punished for watching Squid Games, which is the top rating uh, Netflix uh, series of all time whether it merits watching or not is a separate matter. We can discuss during Q&A if you wish. However, it's a show made in South Korea, uh, perhaps pointedly. And those students, a handful of them, I think, were given five years of hard labor. That's a serious sentence for watching a bit of prohibited material. Uh, a life sentence was handed down to the purchaser. So that was, I think, also a student who had bought the, uh, the, the drive or whatever that these shows were uh, smuggled into the country on. The smuggler, though, has been sentenced to death. So give me liberty or death in the case of stark laws like this. This is unfree speech. None of us, I think, would suggest it's warranted. And I would like probably in discussion to explore the extent to which there's free speech in Australia in contrast to this example and other examples. But I also mentioned that uh, in my final few uh, comments. Okay, we've dealt with Mill in some detail. Um, it is a necessary part of a philosophical education to seriously consider his arguments. And I trust that in the Q&A, we will uh, collectively uh, do that and give, you know, due, due credence to literally hundreds of years of thought. Uh, it didn't start with Mill, but it certainly accelerated and a lot of the thinking has been based on, on his perspective. Um, it's worth mentioning, uh, this is a well-known German idealist um, from also a few hundred years ago, um, George Hegel. Uh, this is just a gloss of really quite a complex work where he talks about master-slave and relationship between you know, those individuals, he suggests we gain self-consciousness only through a process of mutual recognition. So we can't really be ourselves without being accepted by the other, uh, by other people. Now, that doesn't mean we need universal acceptance and love from everyone uh, to gain self-consciousness, but it does mean we need to be recognized by the other. And Franz uh, Fanon, for those of you who might be familiar with him, if you're not, strongly advocate his work on colonialism. And he basically looks at um, being able to reflect yourself or see an image of yourself in the other, roughly as I was paraphrasing before, as a key to the gaining of selfhood. So a colonial subject or a black person who he writes uh, quite uh, 
significantly about, uh, cannot basically gain full personhood without being recognized by the other. And you can probably recognize the tie in there with hate speech because that's effectively a denial of recognition. And it's not one person failing to recognize the other. It's the loud hailer. It's the hate speech online. It's um, widely distributed and unavoidable. We'll get to that point in just a few minutes. Unavoidable speech, which is then directed at variously people of a particular racial group, religion, uh, gender or sexual identity, and so on. All right. Apropos of that, I'll just go through this quickly. There are more examples we can discuss here. Uh, Joe Rogan, some of you will know him. He's quite an interesting, controversial uh, kind of talk host these days in the US. I think he was a mixed martial arts uh, judge, or maybe he still is. He's quite a quite a beefed up guy, and he's got a pretty robust online profile. He was accused by Men's Health recently of basically practicing uh, cancel culture. He was accused of uh, transphobia because of his interview with this lady, Abigail Shreya, who wrote Irreversible, Irreversible Damage, which is a book you can see there, The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters. Okay, leave it to you to argue the merits of that. He himself is considered a critic of cancel culture. Some people think that the response to that interview is itself an example of cancel culture. My quick commentary on cancel culture is it's simply a political tool. It doesn't mean that someone has actually been canceled. It's just a way of raising the stakes in the debate. Uh, CPAC, which is the uh, conservative uh, political action conference in February of next year would like to cancel Sesame Street characters uh, from attending their conference in Florida. So anybody who's a Sesame Street character who's present on tonight's Philosophy Matters session might want to rethink their travel plans for Florida in February of next year because you've been uninvited. Okay. You know, and the reason for that is that those characters were promoting vaccination to children and saying, look, it's all fine and I'm feeling okay and it's a good thing. So, again, the merits of that can be discussed. Joe Rogan has a number of interesting things to say. I'm not saying I agree with any or all or much of what he says, but he's got the idea of the key to happiness doesn't lay in numbers in a bank account, but in the way we make each other make others feel and the way they make us feel. So there's this thing about human relationships there's this thing about society and the merit such as it is, and there's significant merits and moral worth and political value in free speech has to be, in my view, uh, measured against some of the very real measurable harms that can flow from free speech, which perhaps Rogan is suggesting or echoing through that statement, which for me at least seemed to echo some of the, the Hegel mutual recognition ideas from a few centuries back. I'll be brief on this. Those who live in Australia will be somewhat familiar, I imagine, with the Racial Discrimination Act. There is actually quite a significant amount of legislation in this country which does uh, defend free speech within particular limits. 18C is a particularly famous section of that Racial Discrimination Act. It reads, in part, unla it's unlawful to act otherwise than in private if the act is reasonably likely to offend insult, humiliate, or intimidate another person or group of people based on the other person or group's race, color, or national or ethnic origin. Okay, what's sometimes missed in the debates and the heated exchanges is that 18D immediately comes along and qualifies that Section 18C does not, my emphasis added, does not render unlawful anything said or done reasonably and in good faith for any genuine academic, artistic, or scientific purpose, or any other genuine purpose in the public interest. So in Australia, I'm not a lawyer, I'll state that at this point, but I'm pretty clear that there are defamation laws, there are restrictions on commercial speech, as we were discussing a bit earlier, uh, but there is no restriction on being able to criticize a religion, there is nothing that, as far as I understand, amounts to, you know, blasphemic speech. 
So if you want to criticize, fill in the gap, a particular group, a particular cult, a particular religion, whatever, you most certainly can. But if you um, look to humiliate, intimidate, offend, we'll come back to that insult, um, all members of that group, simply because of their membership of that, you know, race, uh, national, ethnic group, then the law does impose restrictions, which also I will argue. All right, um, this is pretty much wrapping up. Um, there's a couple of other references I'd certainly urge you to look at if you want to uh, delve further into this very important debate. Uh, before we do that, let's just look at, um, not a quote, but again, just a paraphrase from uh, some of Joel Feinberg's writing. I've got their harm to others. He also talks about harm to self. He's got a number of basically uh, different uh, titles. Uh, governments, he suggests, are justified in prohibiting by law profoundly offensive behavior, which cannot be avoided and is widely considered as violating deep moral sensibilities. Um, what this relates to is a distinction between mere offense, where someone gets upset because they get called something a little bit unpleasant, and profound offense, where, for example, with the Dutch uh, cartoons, I'm not saying they shouldn't have been published, but there would be an expectation that profound offence would be taken by um, followers of Islam at the Prophet Muhammad uh, being depicted as a uh, terrorist. So those are that's an example of profound offence. Another one which uh, Feinberg and others write about in this literature is the uh, intended or the planned uh, marches by uh, neo-Nazis in the 19s, late 1970s in Skokie, um, Illinois in the US, uh, where the intention was to march in SS uniforms in a mainly or significantly Jewish neighborhood uh, with a lot of Holocaust survivors. And what would the uh, impact be on those individuals? So we need to at least discuss harm, not merely in physical terms. We look at the cap capital insurrections from Jan 6 of this year. We also need to look at psychological harm, about which a great deal is understood now. And we need to consider whether, in Feinberg's term, the, um, the offence is avoidable or not. So Hitchens' example, um, interesting though it is, about standing on one's tippy toes and peering at something that gives one's offence, is actually not, I would argue, um, the, the key thrust of the debate. This is about a unavoidable offence where basically it's in your face, it's online, it's on the street, and your identity, your ethnic, religious, whatever background will be effectively invalidated, which if one follows Hegel or most of the philosophers who understand that there's some sort of social contract and some sort of, you know, mutual dependence of human beings on each other uh, is a significant problem. So we've spoken uh, about Feinberg, certainly worth reading some of his material. It touches on, does more than touch on, significant issues around the, around the harm from pornography. So there's other very significant discussions there we haven't really delved into. Uh, Mill, you've certainly got at least a few, a few pointers from me. Um, common ground between Martin and myself includes um, the benefit of a Bill of Rights. I think we're the only democracy that doesn't have one. Uh, Jeffrey Robertson, at the time that this debate was live in Australia and a Bill of Rights was being considered, wrote the Statute of Liberty. And certainly there's very good material and there's very good reasons to support a Bill of Rights. However, my understanding of the law in this country is um, free speech while not guaranteed in all cases, is certainly protected in most cases. So it would be fair to say that there is a right to free speech. You can look at any human rights page from the various uh, federal government departments, and they will certainly endorse that view. Is it absolutely inviolable? Is it entirely unfettered? Is it constitutionally guaranteed? Well, clearly not, because we don't have those clauses in a constitution and we don't have a Bill of Rights. Um, Freedom of religion, 
And the secular state is a very interesting text and maybe in Q&A rather than now, I could elaborate on some of the concepts around profound offence, which come from the religious domain. That particular author who I happen to have met and know quite well, I do recommend Russell Blackford's writing. I think it's really quite exceptional. Uh, Russell, Dr. Blackford, won't endorse what I'm concluding um, because he'll say that there still should be a right to free speech in almost all of these cases. I would push back and say there will be some cases of profound offence where maybe a, a, an exercised restraint, which actually he is open to, self-restraint in terms of what to publish and what to say, may in fact be beneficial, although at law um, there would still be a right to free speech in all of those cases, including uh, satire and so on. Um, so one of my questions in conclusion is basically whether free speech should be considered the priority right to be protected in all cases, or whether society needs to balance a range of important human rights, which include free speech. So it's certainly not to deprioritize free speech, but it's also to seek uh, to avoid what I would regard as probably a, a philosophical error and a social and political error in my view, uh, to uh, put on a pedestal free speech and not consider the interplay between that important set of rights to free speech and expression and the other very important sets of human rights which are uh, covered in the various charters uh, which Australia is signatory to. Um, you can follow the link online if you like. Here's from Stop Hate UK. Did I mention the number? There were about 124,000, yes, I did earlier on, hate speech incidents in the UK in the year leading to March of this year, just repeating what I said earlier. Um, there's a distinction between free speech and hate speech. Um, it's not without controversy, and we're in a philosophical forum, so by all means, debate, discuss, disagree. But free speech is sharing of opinion through open discussion. It's a way of learning, teaching, criticizing, moving forward, shared understanding. Yes, more absolutely said, you know, we should not silence one person with a different opinion. That is absolutely fair. However, hate speech targets particular groups. It usually involves malicious intentions. It's insults around individual identity, including trans identity. There are so many examples of it right now in every jurisdiction. Racism, sexism, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, disabledist, xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism. And that's probably just the main ones that they thought convenient to put on the slide. There is more. Free speech, yes. Hate speech, defamatory. Um, prejudicial speech, which is unavoidable by the general population, which a lot of things are, which has consequences, real and predictable consequences, and which presents, in the wo words of the uh, US Supreme Court, a clear and present danger, uh, is certainly well worth uh, protecting ourselves against rather than simply guaranteeing and regarding as protected speech. Uh, more to say, but thank you so much for your time. And those are at least my opening comments. Look forward to your thoughts shortly. Thank you very much, um, Akiva um, and Martin. Um, thinking about tonight, I was made me think about why I called this group Philosophy Matters. And I think tonight's two speakers really illustrate how this area of philosophy and others impacts our social and political and individual lives. And, and I was thinking about one case, which we haven't talked about tonight, brought to mind because George Christensen, the, I think he's a, a National Party um, politician here in Australia, and he appeared on Alex Jones's show in the US. Alex Jones, if you don't know him in the US, he's a grand conspirator. And he ran the very successful uh, and ran it very richly, the InfoWars um, conglomerate. And um, Alex Jones was the one who literally made up the story that the parents of the uh, Sandy Hook Elementary School massacre, where a number of many young children and their teachers were gunned down, 
Alex Jones made up the story that the su supposed parents weren't really parents of the dead children, that they were actors and all of this was fake acting. And I was thinking, sure, actually one parent sued and sued successfully Alex Jones. And I'm thinking, do we really need to wait for a private defamation suit or should that kind of deliberate uh, lying uh, through a very public uh, media channel, um, ought it be made illegal independently of, you know, somebody filing a suit before. So it's these kinds of issues that impact all of our, all of our lives. And so thank you, um, Martin and Akiva for bringing all of the, the particular points um, to bear. Uh, so what we're, what we're going to do now is we're going to have a little interchange between Martin and um, Akiva for a few minutes so that they can challenge each other, ask questions of each other, and then we'll go to questions from the audience. Wow. So I've been taking just a lot of notes um, and was also briefly going through the uh, absolute smashing of uh, feedback in the in the in the uh in the channel there um a couple of people have said some things which just blow my mind i'm going to say that put it out there not naming names but it's like wow okay um but my i'll say my trump card my go-to will be um which usha has already very clearly uh replied to someone when though when uh, some of my views were being challenged uh, and she reiterated what I was trying to get to uh, the whole time is that my premise is based upon the fact that people, um, what's being said is going to be listened to by people who are rational and compassionate listeners. If you're not rational, if you're not compassionate and not slightly discerning, then yeah, there's going to be trouble. Okay, so I'm going to presume that there are some people out there who have an IQ a bit bigger than their belt size and are able to listen to some things whether they like it or not. That's my basic premise. Um, however, I wanted to touch upon, uh, this has been brought up as well, and I wanted to say about YouTube and censorship, that it has come up uh, time and time again, I'll someone delete my comment, and it's been tested at least uh, many times um, uh, in, in America, and they're really trying to do something in Australia about um, using actual real life identity for posting online. But um, the way I see it is a separation between what is the public sphere on public land versus um, private corporations. And they are obviously, one is going to be able to override the other. But yeah, I do agree um, absolutely that private corporations should be allowed to censor what they don't want to be circulated inside because it's their own private business. They can do what they like. You've agreed using terms of services to abide by their rules. Um, so therefore, I completely agree that for some of these things, private corporations are exempt and they probably should be. Um, with anti-vax information going out, again, I have to say, I don't want to stop it. If that sounds mean, I know. Please let me state why. Because if it's, if it stays on, you know, if someone's going to put anti-vax information out there on a private corporate server or things like that. That's up to the corporation to, to deal with. They can, they can deal with all that, all, all they want. Um, and if you go through history about people post, uh, getting posters and nailing them on, on um, telegraph poles and all, all the rest of it to get information out, that information could be true, could be false, could be half and half. Um, but in the public sphere, I believe nothing should be banned. Pro provided that during the production of that material, Everyone was well informed and consented to that information being out and nobody was hurt. I take a little bit of an extreme libertarian uh, stance with that, but that's what I believe. Inside corporate walls, it doesn't matter because if you want to go and say something to a CEO of a company, guess what? You try and go into, march into their office and start yelling at them and all the rest of it, you're going to be escorted away by security and for very good reason. The free speech laws and whatnot, uh, and, and all the other exemptions don't apply there. And I, I can understand why and how it got that way. Um, Martin, can I interject with the question? 
which to me gets to the hub of many of the things you say now and you said in your presentation, sure. which is whether, whether you acknowledge that in certain circumstances, and you can stipulate what those circumstances are if you wish, that real and demonstrable harms can flow from unfettered free speech. Do you acknowledge that there is, there are cases where people can die, people can get hurt, uh, people can have their lives significantly negatively impacted on by unfettered free speech, which targets them or their group? Absolutely. Yeah, it, it can happen, does happen. Um, I gave examples of um, the call for Salman Rushdie's death. Um, Ayan Hirsi Ali made a documentary with a producer. He's now dead uh, because the death threat was called for him and he was uh, that execution was successfully put through. Um, yeah, it, it can. I, I think where it becomes a fine line becomes where was the threat issued? Where is it being executed? Who's listening to it? And why are they acting upon it? And I think that there's a lot of um, religious inspiration behind a lot of it. I will put that out there. Um, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, absolutely. If you want to call for the death of someone in Parliament Square or whatever, it, it, it's going to happen. People are going to get riled up. But you would hope that people are a bit more of a discerning nature. Um, I, I really, like I said, it comes down to political aspects of where the message is being sent, where it's being heard, who's acting upon it, and what the local laws apply. Okay, so there'll be plenty of time to prosecute this argument further, but effectively my response is relying on the goodwill of individuals regarding relying on the critical abilities of uh, listeners to a message, but particularly regard, relying on the intention and the decency of speakers is surely a fool's errand. Uh, history is replete and common uh, contemporary times, similarly so, with bad actors in society. So if you acknowledge the first point that in some cases, uh, significant and uh, undesirable harms flow from free speech, and unless you want to hold to a view of human nature, which seems largely indefensible in my view, just given you know the actors we see as recently as you know Christchurch terror attacks or the murders of the British MPs that I mentioned and the list goes on, um, then how can we not, if we're seeking to protect people's lives and well-being, consider cases where uh, limitations on protected speech are required? I think I can only go back to that slide of mine where I say, indirectly, it's already being dealt with. Human nature is human nature. People are going to do stupid things and they're going to act in stupid ways and they're going to say stupid things. If People can issue death threats all they want. Um, if someone goes to act upon that, we've got laws that say, you were a bad person, go into a concrete cell because of it and hope that that's enough of a, of a deterrent and sends the message out. So I'm like, get the message out, whatever it may be, and whoever it may or may not affect, and let the consequences show others who may want to indulge in um, that activity the same. So I'm putting, again, the responsibility on the people who are listening to it and acting upon it. The person saying it shouldn't have to. Um, I just want to um, close off that, that um, my response by saying um, th there's a quote I found ages ago and it said, I'm only responsible for what I say, not for what you don't understand or how, or how that makes you feel. I, I just want to also say about um, 18C and 18D, the Racial Discrimination Act. I think it was before 18D was introduced, there was a heavy, heavily um, religious influence behind that. And, and uh, when I was reading uh, on your slide just there, I just wanted to say that um, I'm worried that they kind of clash because we need to define what is reasonable. And I only see um, Sue Happy applicants uh, coming out of this and then basically you're saying, oh, we're allowed to discriminate, oh, but we're allowed to do it within these things. It's like you just said we're allowed to do this 100% and then you gave us a 99% reason why it shouldn't be done because of fair use, criticism, blah, blah, blah. So 
I just don't see why that section was even done like that. Uh, just a quick response on 18C and 18D. Uh, that racial discrimination act was just used in the last year. Uh, Peter Credlin, those in the Australian context will know, she was a former chief of staff to then Prime Minister Tony Abbott uh, for two years. Or was that 2013 to 2015, something like that? Stand to be corrected. Um, so a well-known political figure. She's now a... Um, uh, commentator, whatever presenter on Sky News, she said uh, last year on on her program or whichever program on Sky News that the Sudanese community had contributed to the spread of COVID and it was related to Ramadan practices. Uh, she just had to issue an apology because the Human Rights uh, Commission required her to. That came out in the last day that that's the reason why she issued that apology. And it sets the record straight because she claimed that most of that population were not literate in English. Uh, that turns out not to be the case. She also made the reference to Ramadan. Most of that community is actually Christian. And there was no uh, link between that community, the Sudanese community in Melbourne uh, from South Sudan and any COVID outbreak. So I would say those are perhaps uh, chilling, but in a good way. Uh, consequences of 18C and 18D, you can make fair comment, but if you're targeting a group and you have no factual basis in doing so, I think the uh, Racial Discrimination Act um, and Sexual Discrimination Act, etc., have some similar clauses, I believe, uh, served its purpose and uh, basically put a bit of a chill on, on speech, which otherwise could have consequences longer term about the uh, acceptance and respect afforded to particular communities for no reason based in fact, but just because of the commentary of a particular uh, speaker on TV. Based on what Akiva just said, um, this is only uh, my sort of awareness of it, was um, at the start when the uh, racial bits was put into that particular clause about racial commenting and critique and whatnot, um, there was a lot uh, at least in my experience and my exposure and reading, there was a lot of bias against um, p people still being um, anti anti Islamic, and people then transferred that to being anti Muslim, and then the Christians got on board as well to try and sponsor that um, that uh, addition, that edit to to the bill uh, because um, Islam sees itself uh, not just as a religion but as an ideology and as a race which really muddies the waters a bit. And um, I'm uh, Hitchens came across this years ago. He already warned against it. This is not my words. I'm basically transferring and clarifying how I think it got into the uh, crap load that uh, is Australian politics. Um, but yeah, I believe that there was a heavily religious influence behind it. Thanks, Martin. Okay, let's um, close off this part of the program. I'd like to thank Martin, uh, Martin Coleman and Akiva Quinn again for really highlighting some of the issues that come to the fore when we're discussing um, freedom of speech. So thank you both. To access other videos and podcasts in this series, go to the Philosophy Resources section of the Rational Realm website at www.rationalrealm.com.